Okay, I got it. Okay, so I want to say uh, good afternoon to my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. David Williams, coming to us today uh, from the Harvard, uh, T.H. Chan Harvard uh, School of Public Health. Uh, hello, David, how are you doing? I am doing well, Woody, and surely looking forward to this conversation with you. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm certainly uh, looking forward to it as well. And I know a lot of the, um, the research scientists and general uh, community uh, will also get a great deal uh, from this presentation once we put it up on the PRBA uh, website. <clears throat> so because our, our time is limited, and I know you have a lot to tell us, I certainly have a lot to ask you about. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to jump right in and say thank you. And where I want to start this interview uh, is with uh, David Williams, the early years. Okay. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about, um, you know, your childhood um, and, you know, your early education. And I have a, some specific questions that I'm going to ask about, uh, <clears throat> you know, a couple of your degrees. Uh, but why don't you start there and just tell us a little bit about uh, who you are from that aspect. Sure. So I grew up on the eastern Caribbean island of St. Lucia. Um, uh, come from a working class background, I, I would say. Um, when I was growing up, neither of my parents had been to high school. Um, but both of them were studious readers. We didn't have much at home, but we had a lot of books. Mm -hmm. um, and most of my parents were outstanding speakers um, in in the local in the local church we went to, and 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 quite um, informed and knowledgeable. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I said my father never went to high school. He served in the British uh, West Indian um, uh, military, so he had a, a military background. That was the we the, he was. St. Lucia was a British colony when he was young during World War II. Mm -hmm. And so he served in, in the armed forces of the British government. Uh, but he was he was uh, uh, very studious. I mean, he took um, like correspondence courses on auto mechanics. Um, he was uh, uh, very involved uh, in church as a local lay person and preaching. He took a course in Greek. So I knew the Greek alphabet. Um, from from a child because he had us running around the house saying Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta um, because he was studying Greek. So so my parents were very, um, uh, I would say, very intellectually oriented, although they didn't have a lot of formal uh, preparation. Um, I am the fourth of five children. All of my older siblings uh, did very well in school. Um, all of us went to college. Um, my two sisters are both professors at universities in the United States. Um, so uh, I think we've, we all want a pathway of academic success. And I had the example of older brothers who did well, um, both at debating, they were both in, in a debating club, but also doing well academically. Um, I think after high school, I taught for a year. Um, and then I went to college in Trinidad. I went to a, a small Christian college in Trinidad. And I, I majored, there was only one bachelor's degree area, and I was theology, and I majored in theology. Um, I, I, I would also say very, very importantly, I was a child of the 60s. Um, so when I was growing up, um, I think my, my heroes were people like Martin Luther King uh, or John F. Kennedy, um, I, I remember, um, in part because of their rhetoric about justice uh, and equality. Um, the, the black, it's important to realize living in St. Lucia, I lived closer to New York City than someone in Los Angeles lives in New York City. Mm -hmm. And we live very much in the U.S. media market. So yeah. we, we follow everything that happens in the U.S. So I very closely followed um, the civil rights movement um, and, and the success. And it, it turned out that there were some um, of persons active in the civil rights movement who had Caribbean roots, um, like Stokely Carmichael. Uh, was his or original name uh, mm -hmm. from the region and who was also banned from some of the islands um, uh, when we were growing up because of the trying to to keep away the more revolutionary aspects of it. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think concerns about social justice, concerns about making a difference in society uh, were very important to me. And when I finished college in Trinidad, I, I went to... Uh, I moved on to, I'd done a bachelor's degree in theology, and one of my professors was encouraging me to go on to higher education so I could come back to the region and be a teacher. And so I went on and did a master's degree 
um, in divinity at, at a small uh, religious university in Michigan, Andrews University in the Benton Harbor, St. Joseph area of Michigan, a small town named Berrien Springs. Um, so let me uh, let me jump let me, in. Let me just make one point because I'm going to show you how the transition to public health and studying oh, okay. um, uh, in my divinity course. I took a course in uh, in, in in health um, in terms of thinking about how um, health is important, and I, I thought of health as a way in which you could um, intervene at a community level and really make a difference at the community level in terms of improving uh, community health. And that was my motivation. I transitioned straight from an MDiv into a massive public health in community health education because I thought of using a church base as a way in which uh, to improve the health of the community. So my motivation there was was one of, of equity, one of service, one of making a difference in the lives of others at a local community. And my initial vision was doing that from the, the base of a church. Yeah, so I appreciate that because I, I was always aware of the MDiv. And I'm going to ask you in a second about the MPH, but I, I knew about your MDiv, but I never had the story of, of how you, um, you know, developed into that master of divinity. But here's, you just told me something I wasn't quite aware of. You, you started that part of your education in Michigan. Can you say a little bit about how you ended up in the state of Michigan? Sure. Um, so I was, um, I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist. It was my specific religious denomination. Uh, the school mm -hmm. I went to in Trinidad was a Seventh-day Adventist school. Um, I, I think the Seventh-day Adventist church has two flagship universities, has many academic institutions in the United States, but the two flagship universities would be Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan, and Loma Linda University in Loma Linda, California. Um, so it, it was not, uh, many of my teachers, for example, had gone to Andrews University, um, who, who I had in Trinidad. So it was not, uh, uh, it, it was a normal path, I would say, yeah. of persons to move from one to uh, a better university within the same kind of, if you want to think, social network. Right. Um, and so that, that explained the move to Michigan. So I, I was very aware, you know, that you were at Loma Linda. Mm -hmm. And so now I understand, you know, how this is really yes. fitting together in a very yeah. uh, rational, coherent, uh, way, co coherent, you know, <laughs> but also, you know, very uh, socio-political way, yes. you know, because That's I right. too am a child of the 60s. I was mm -hmm. born in the early 50s and uh, I remember very clearly all those major transitions yeah. that were happening. Uh, before I ask you to talk about Loma Linda, I will ask you to briefly tell uh, a story that I'm often asked to tell, <clears throat> and that is uh, remembering exactly where I was when I got the news that John F. Kennedy, or JFK, as we called him, uh, had been uh, assassinated. Now, you said you were in, you know, the U.S., media market do you remember where you were that day and when that so, happened i don't remember the specific day i do remember the time um uh, we I, I was in the u.s media market but in the early 60s on the caribbean island in which i grew up there was no television mm -hmm. so it was radio mm -hmm. um uh, so i think it would not have been as vivid uh, for someone um, in the context of radio. So I, I do remember uh, that JFK um, died, but I, I don't have like a vivid picture imagery of it. I, I do remember the news of it. I also remember there was a, uh, I would say the, the king of Calypso um, back at the time, um, someone called the Mighty Sparrow wrote a Calypso about the death of 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 um, John F. Kennedy. And I remember as a child, we would be singing this song um, about the death of John F. Kennedy. And yeah. so it, it was very real. It is something I remember, but I don't yeah. have a vivid memory of the specific day per se when it happened. And I think that's probably due to more relying on, on news at that time, more from a radio than from a television. So moving forward to your um, days at Loma Linda, um, I've always tried to typecast you as a health educator. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I always thought it made a very nice contrast yeah. to my stereotype 
about sociology, which we'll get into yes. in a second. So, you know, tell me how far off I am on this. When you went to Loma Linda, did you go to become a health educator or did you go there to become more of a community health uh, activist or community health researcher? I, I, I honestly was not thinking of research. I okay. was thinking of, uh, you could think of me as a community health, I, I didn't see a, a gap between a community health educator, community health activist at some level, but maybe less an activist and more educator. I really thought that one way in which we could make a difference in the lives of, of others was through education. Mm -hmm. At the School of, of Public Health, you could have done an MPH in many areas. You could yeah. have done it in epidemiology or in nutrition or in biostat or in global health. And I did it in health education because, and, and within health education, there was a track where you could do more like school health education or community health education. And I did the community health education track. I, I really wanted to learn of how I can work with local community um, and improve health. So that, that was my focus was, was um, health improvement at a community level. And what I would say, um, from Loma Linda, I, I took a, a, a job. My first job was back in Michigan um, mm -hmm. at, at the Battle Creek Adventist Hospital uh, in, in Battle Creek, Michigan, where I was hired by the health education department of the hospital with two responsibilities. It's a hospital that had been in that community for over 100 years, had had a long history of community health education dating back to the days of its famous, one of its famous directors, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, who mm -hmm. invented cornflakes and yeah. uh, invented, coined the term granola and tried to offer these breakfast cereals as alternative to bacon and eggs for breakfast out of his, again, <laughs> um, focus on uh, health and, and improving health. And so my assignment was community health. Even though I was based in the hospital, I wasn't, there was another health educator who had patient health, but I was in charge of community health and employee health. And I would say 10% of my time was addressing um, employee health and 90% was developing programs to enhance the health of the community. For example, I ran a weekly blood pressure clinic where people would come in and, and for free and I would check their blood pressure, talk to them about what they could do in terms of managing blood pressure. We developed stress management programs we'd offer to the community. We had a, a smoke and cessation program. We would offer it at a hospital. We'd be also go to business, large businesses and offer it like on a lunch hour uh, basis for others. I developed a weight management program that offered to the community, um, a risk reduction program for cardiovascular disease. So I was, I was really heavily engaged. So although technically my job was eight to five, I typically went into work late in the morning because a lot of the programs for the community would be evening programs after yeah. work. And yeah. I would get home, you know, 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. Right. So um, I spent a little time teaching uh, students who wanted an MPH. And one of the things I know about the MPH is, is that it's a, honest to God, terminal degree. Most people get that MPH and they want to go to work. And it sounds like yeah. you, know, you were able to get a fantastic job. And I'd say the bulk of the MPH students do not want to return to school to get into research. But something must have happened you know, with you doing all of these great community health education programs, can you give us a little insight into the spark that turned it around for you to say, hey, I need to go back and get a research degree? To, to be honest with you, I always thought that I would go on to do a doctorate. Um, now, I was not to be honest with you, not clear about how much a PhD involved research per se, but mm. in my mind, it was only a matter of time until I would go on to do a doctorate. But mm -hmm. specifically in, in my position, I actually worked as a health educator for just under two years. Mm -hmm. and, and what happened was, uh, it, it, well, uh, first, uh, um, I was working as a health educator. I remember one week there was a former professor I'd had at um, in in at when I was at Andrews University um, in Barron Springs, Michigan, um, who 
my wife and I had met at church one weekend, and he just happened to be visiting because his father-in-law was a patient in the hospital. We saw him there at church, and we invited him, him over to a one-bedroom apartment, mm -hmm. you know, to ha have lunch with us. And he said, David, what, what are you doing about your PhD? I said, well, I would plan to do one one of these days. Um, he says, what, what do you want to do it in? I, I said, well, I, I've been thinking seriously about sociology, and I can get back to why I was thinking about sociology. I said, yeah. I'm thinking of sociology, and I know that Western Michigan University, which was the closest to where we lived in Battle Creek in Kalamazoo, Michigan, had a PhD in sociology. I knew that Michigan State had a PhD in sociology. I knew the University of Michigan. So I told him, I, I've looked at these three schools and I noticed they have a PhD. If anything, I was leaning towards Western Michigan University for one practical reason, I probably wouldn't have to move. It was yeah. closer yeah. than the other two. And he said to me, he had had a PhD in history from Michigan. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, you have to go to Michigan. <laughs> he sounds he said, like a, a, a real Wolverine. Yes, he, he was. <laughs> he said, you have, he says, unless you want to go to Harvard, that was his exact words. But he says, you have to go to Michigan. You cannot get better training than Michigan. You have to go to Michigan. So I would say that that was pivotal. When I mm -hmm. think of different points in my career that are really key turning points is was that chance conversation with a former professor who said, Michigan is the place you need to go. And so I applied that fall to go to Michigan still to see what would happen and so forth. But early this spring, the very same week, I got notice from my hospital that it was going through a, a financially difficult time. They were going to lay off a quarter of the employees. Ooh. And I fell into the that 25% that was going <laughs> to be laid off in 60 days. Um, and the same week I got that news, I got an acceptance to the University of Michigan. So it was like those two things happening together in the same week. Um, my wife and I said, okay, we're moving. We're going to Ann Arbor, you know. We're going to and Ann Arbor. That, that explains yeah. it. Yeah. But yeah. what I want to talk about is sure. why I thought of sociology. Yeah, I, I want to hear that uh, part of it. Yeah, I, I think it was important. So I was trained in, in, in health education. Um, I think maybe health education has changed now, but when I was trained in health education, you know, the health belief model and thinking of the barriers and, and so forth and, and doing the education, it did not seriously address the social context, the social context of, of communities, of poor communities, of disadvantaged racial ethnic communities. I, I really think I was not fully equipped of how to deal with that. And I faced a dilemma at the hospital. The hospital at the time where I worked was really located in what had become part of the black community in, 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 in Battle Creek. It probably was not that way 100 years ago when Dr. Kellogg worked there, but that's what it was now. Yet most of the clients I dealt with, although the hospital is physically located in the black community, Almost all the people I dealt with who came to the program for the free blood pressure clinic or the programs we would advertise were white. Yeah. And I, I was kind of troubled that I am not reaching my community. And I there was maybe four blocks from the hospital. There was a, a AME Methodist Church there, um, Reverend Bullock. Um, he was that was the center of the community, had all kinds of programs and services for the community. It was a community hub. And I remember going to talk with him. And and letting him know that that I was here and what were the programs I offered to the community and, and letting him know that I wanted to be more effective in, in reaching uh, the community and engaging with them. And he said, you know what, um, why not come to church on Sunday? I'll give you a few minutes during the worship service. I'll introduce you and you can get up and, and talk to my congregation about what what are, what are the programs and services you offer. Um, and I did. I went there. I he introduced me, and I spoke to them, and I got amens and so forth. But nothing changed the next few weeks. I was not getting more black folk. You uh, you, uh, you needed more amens. You more, <laughs> I got I got more, more, more amens than I got people coming. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember talking to a health educator. I can't remember where she was in L.A. and just sharing my frustration that I am yeah. not reaching the population where I have a huge burden for. And she told me what she had done. Uh -huh. She said what she's done, she has moved to be offering 
community health education programs to the church during the week on the nights when the church had services. And she would set up uh, her uh, uh, programs just before uh, church services. So she'd take care, of, uh, you know, take advantage of that captive audience. And I thought, brilliant idea. So I went back to Reverend Bullock and told him, you know, I'd love to move uh, a week, have a weekly high blood pressure clinic. Right. One of the programs he had was a program that, that um, served senior citizens. And you'd get 50, 60 people uh, come in there. Um, I can't remember how many days a week, but I picked one day a week. And I would go there, set up my table with my blood pressure screen. And I would be screening 50, 60 people, um, African-Americans in one day. Um, and it, for me, it, it, it was really learning of how instead of expecting the community to come to where I was, I needed to find ways of how do I reach people where they were. And if I did that, in fact, I could be very effective in reaching them. But more broadly, it, it made me think of I really have to think much more deeply than I think my MPH had given me of what are the challenges uh, poor, uh, disadvantaged, racial, ethnic minority populations face? And how can we be more effective in working with them to address some of those challenges? And, and that's where sociology appealed to me as the discipline that would provide me the understanding, the skills to be more effective in making a difference for um, disadvantaged uh, racial, ethnic communities in the United States, primarily the African-American community. So that, so that explains my interest in yeah. my shift from public health to sociology. Yeah, and I'm just going to dig in on that just a little bit. Yes. And then we're going to move on mm -hmm. uh, to, an, to another topic. But I, I find that, you know, that uh, description ex extremely fascinating. Am I correct in hearing you say that um, when you realized that, you know, the uh, hospital was located within the black community, but the clientele servicing the, or the, the clientele that the hospital was servicing was predominantly white. Am I correct that your working hypothesis at that time, you know, try to understand that? Was it already a, a structural uh, explanation that you were working toward as opposed to the traditional health education um, scenario would be, oh, you know, it's all about the uh, inappropriate individual decision making of the consumer. And so we really need to focus on that. But it sounds like you had a little yeah. bit broader perspective in mind. Is is that Am I, I think you're right. I, I I would say my my structural understanding was not well developed, but, but yes, but it was I, I thought of that. Yeah. And and I thought, by the way, I didn't mention the my supervisor, the head of the health education department at the hospital, was also and was an African American woman trained okay. as a public health educator. And okay. she had gone. I'll give you one example that that illustrates this. She had gone on a trip to Africa and had looked at traditional African diets and showed how healthy and and wholesome and foods base were the traditional African-American diets. And I remember she came back um, and she offered, um, I think it was a two part series that was entitled The Roots of Soul Food. Oh, yeah. And she was again appealing to <laughs> the African-American community, had this free lecture on the roots of soul food, what we can learn from Africans. And there was a good turnout for the program. But the majority of people that came out to the program were white, even though she thought with the roots of soul food, she's trying to reach her community and so on. But it's, it, it, it just illustrates that we were really not connecting yeah. with, with the immediate community. Yeah, well, I, I too have often uh, wondered about the roots of soul food. And, <laughs> you know, my search took me to uh, North Carolina. <laughs> in my uh, participant uh, observation of the mac and cheese. So, okay. uh, which I've learned is not especially healthy for me, but, right. you know, we don't always do what we know we should do. And yeah. to me, that's the paradox of health education. But we need to, we need to move on. Yes, sure. Um, because I want to, I want to get up into the structure mm -hmm. and I want to get into sociology. Um, you know, I think you could have, gone in a variety of directions, you know, personally, I yeah. think you should have, you should have gone into uh, 
public health immediately okay. <laughs> and become a social epidemiologist, <laughs> you know, but I, I have my own biases. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense that you went into sociology. And, um, you know, I was telling you earlier that I, I, that I have these stereotypes of academic sociologists, and I know a lot of sociologists. My favorite sociologists are medical sociologists. So I wanted to hear whether uh, you gravitated in any way toward medical sociology when you were doing your training. I would say yes and no. I, okay. I would say no because at Michigan at the time, there mm -hmm. was no um, medical sociology emphasis. There was not an area of specialization within the department. Although at the time, if you looked at the American Sociological Association and it had different sections during that time, the largest section in the American Sociological Association was the medical sociology section. So, right. so yes, that a lot of sociologists belong to that. But Michigan had training in demography, mm -hmm. um, in what was called social organization, more the traditional social um, uh, the traditional um, um, sociology, what people would think of, and in social psychology. And so I did social psychology because I, I had thought, to be honest with you, of possibly doing a PhD in psychology. And I, I, I social psychology was perfect because it dealt both with the individual and the social structure. And I, I clearly had interest in both. And so I did my, my training in in social psychology. However, within social psychology, there were there was uh, uh, when I went to Michigan, there was one medical sociology course taught. Mm -hmm. It was at a, a advanced undergraduate level. I took it because yeah. that was the only medical sociology course. But I also went to Michigan where there was a training program out of the Department of Sociology run by uh, Ron Kessler and, and, and Jim House that was on psychosocial factors in mental health and mental illness. Yeah. So I had Funding. I didn't. I was never funded by that training program, but I was what they called an affiliate, so yeah. that I attended uh, the seminars for that every week for my four years of training at Michigan, and and that was probably where I got uh, my health, most of my health training. Um, so it was in one part of medical sociology, really psychosocial factors in health, um, and it came from really being an affiliate fellow of that NIMH uh, training program. And um, I mean, what was the impact on your, you know, your thinking and your approach from attending the psychosocial factors and mental health and mental, I mean, hanging out with Jim House and uh, Ron Kessler, tell us just a little bit of how that yeah, no, no, it, it, it resonated with me. And I, I would say that um, for at least two of my years um, in grad school, I worked on a, a project as, as a study manager for a project that they were doing, uh, looking at the impact of the stress of unemployment on health. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we are looking at how does the larger social environment uh, af affect health. So that, that was really, um, I think, good experience. For me, I worked with Jim House on, he had at, at that time had been doing a lot of work on social relationships and, and its effects on health. And I remember working with him and another student on a review paper he was doing of the literature um, mm -hmm. uh, on that topic. So yes, I, I, I did have um, good experiences that, that helped me and enhanced my understanding of the ways in which the health of individuals are embedded in the social conditions in which they live and work. So you were clearly, you know, hanging out around the Institute for Social Research. Right. You were in sociology. Uh, you were being exposed to, you know, Kessler and House version of, uh, I'll just call it this, the stress process. And when I think of those two individuals, uh, I think about Ron Kessler a little bit more as a, uh, uh, a psychiatric epidemiologist. I don't think of Jim House quite in that way. He's a little right. broader. Um, did you develop any interest during those days in you know what people tend to call mental health, but it's really mental illness and mental disorder? Tell us a little bit about your feel your exposure to that kind of thing. 
Yeah, I, I would say that the the training program that I was a part of was not centrally focused on mental health and mental disorder. I mean, I, I, that was a part of it. I mean, I, in those days, the the findings of the ECA um, study was were, were coming out. But I, I think we really were focused much more broadly at that time compared to where Ron Kessler is now on thinking of mental health on, on a continuum uh, with more work on, on psychological distress uh, as an outcome than on, on clinical disorders. So the, the problem was not um, very um, clinically focused, but thinking really of uh, social contextual factors. I mean, Rick Price was involved with, with the program as well, as was Camille Wortman, her work mm -hmm. on coping, um, mm -hmm. uh, Jill Joseph from the School of Public Health. It, it was a good group of people. Um, and I, I think it was it was broader, uh, not just social, but it, you got the, the kind of psychosocial, both the social as well as psychological factors that affect Would it, uh, by the way, thinking of Jill Joseph, uh, that's a name I hadn't thought of in a while. Yeah. Um, and I remember, you know, she was in epidemiology over in the School of yeah. Public Health. Mm -hmm. And the thing that was distinctive about her um, was that she left her tenure track position in epi to go to medical school. And I hadn't seen that done <laughs> very often. Yes. So uh, based on this interview, I'm going to have to try to track down Yes. Jill Joseph. And... I don't know why. I remember that happened too, yeah. but I wasn't yeah. that close with her. So I, I don't have a sense of what, what drove her to that. But I do remember and thought it was a little unusual <laughs> at the time yeah. when it happened, but but have no deep insights on what. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't either. So we'll yeah. uh, we'll have to get her in here for an interview one of these days. Yeah. But going going back to um, the training program, and then I'm going to move on from there. Mm -hmm. uh, would, it, would it be fair to to say that that training program was much more interested in what we would call the exposures as opposed to the outcomes in the stress process? Yes, I, I definitely the exposures and we got a good mix of exposures to risk factors as well yeah. as kind of resilience resources because Jim's work on, on social ties and, and we did work on occupational stress as well. Um, so yes, it, it was broad in terms of thinking of the social environment and health, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and you mentioned something. I, I wanted to give you a chance just to spell it out for mm -hmm. our listeners. Uh, you mentioned something called the ECA. Can you just say a little bit more about what that is? Sure, that was the, it stood for the Epidemiologic Catchment Area Study. And I think it was in the United States, the first population based um, studies in, in, in five communities, if I remember correctly, um, where a measure of mental disorders were, were, were used, was used uh, in terms of assessing um, the, the prevalence um, and, and correlates of, of psychiatric disorders in the United States. And, and early in my career, when I began as an assistant professor, one of the things I did was actually to do secondary analysis of the ECA. I started out at Yale, and Yale had been one of the sites, Gerald Myers, the senior medical sociologist <laughs> in uh, my area I think, had uh, done that. I think Phil Leaf was Yes, Phil Yale Leaf was, was there at Yale at a, at a time too. But Jerome was, was actually, Phil Leaf was in the School of Public Health. Jerome Myers was, was in sociology. Uh, I worked with him some, and he, he was somewhat of a mentor. I was a junior medical sociology faculty. He was a senior medical sociology faculty. So he was somewhat of a mentor to me. Phil Leaf did run a training program mm -hmm. in, in, in mental health. Um, I can't remember what, what was the title of it that I was not officially a part of. I, I mean, I, I was in, welcome to the faculty and I attended the regular seminars uh, and which is where I met David Takeuchi. Yeah. And he was a postdoc in the program right. when I started right. out as an assistant professor. And he's been a lifelong buddy of mine from, right. from those early days in New Haven. Right. Yeah, well, you know, maybe on the next interview, we can go a little bit more in depth on the um, the paradigm shift and the revolution yep. of uh, DSM-3, yes. or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Third Revision, which certainly contributed to that transition from studying right. stress to studying disorders. Sure. And, and the ECA, the Epidemiologic Catchment Area Program was a big part of that. Yes. 
uh, was probably the linchpin, I think, in my opinion, of yeah. shifting that. Um, but we we need to move on. Yes. Uh, and and so this seems like a really good time. Oh, and by the way, I'm I'm very happy you just referred to yourself as a medical sociologist. Yes. So from this right. day forward, I'm I'm just gonna think yes. of you as a medical sociologist. Yeah, <laughs> you know, even, even though you only took that one class. That's right. You know, I think that's the same class I took. But you know, I, I was I could, hired. I was hired. Max Heyrich taught the class I took. Uh -huh. I, I was hired as for Yale. The position at Yale was a junior medical sociology faculty position. That was that was the job I, I took at Yale. It was a medical sociology it's position. It's a good thing you took that class. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, but this seems like a good time for us to transition into the area that I think um, you, you're you're known for many many things. But uh, you know, you've been writing on this topic for years. And I think recently, given the kind of events we've been experiencing in the United States, there's been a growth of uh, interest yeah. in this general topic, which I'm going to call uh, racism. But I'm actually going to ask you to, to tell the audience a little bit more about something else. And that is uh, the story of how you came to develop a measure of everyday discrimination. And it's not necessarily racial discrimination, although that's part of it. Um, and I think a lot of us know that the, the stimulus is built around unfair treatment. So, you know, you put this together and I know you had your reasons for linking into unfair treatment as the criterion for discrimination and that discrimination comes in many forms racial being one of them. Uh, so kind of start with uh, the early days of that, and, and we'll just kind of try to work through that together. Sure, that sounds good. Before I do, I, I do want to say some things, um, okay. because this is a PRBA audience as well. Yes. Um, and that is in my graduate training, I was not heavily involved with PRBA. I, I was at ISR. I, I had an office there throughout my, so I was very much aware of PRBA. I was very much aware of James. I had a very good working relationship with James to say hello and, and to talk with him and so on. And I was aware of PRBA staff, but I was not centrally involved. I do recall for one of my courses, I worked on a paper that I wanted to do analysis of NSBA data. Uh, mm -hmm. for uh, this was a paper for a course um, in sociology. I don't really remember what exactly it was, but I remember talking to James and James put me in touch with Shirley Hatchett. Yeah. And I remember so one semester I worked closely with Shirley Hatchett and she was supervising me and the analyses I was doing and giving me uh, feedback. And that was probably as close as I worked with PRBA was working with Shirley Hatchett for that semester on this paper I was writing for one of my courses. What is intriguing, I had a good relationship with James. And after I left Michigan and took an assistant professor position at Yale, I started to meet James at meeting and we started to talk more about research. And mm -hmm. I literally started collaborating with James on research when I was now an assistant professor at Yale and no longer at, at, at Michigan. So um, and and when I came back to Michigan after I got promoted um, to uh, associate professor at Yale, I came back to to Michigan, then my relationship with PRBA, I, I then joined PRBA as one of its regular faculty, although I had a, a primary office again within ISR in the Survey Research Center, but I started to work closely with PRBA and, and, and very closely with James Jackson specifically, but it, it's in, intriguingly that my, my really sitting down and talking with James about research and papers started when I was no longer, but it was built on the fact that we had a good relationship when I was a graduate student at Michigan. That, that's a great story. And I, I appreciate you, you know, stopping my flow to, <laughs> no to fill us in. Yeah, that's great. I, thank you for that. So let, let me, so I, I am now back at Michigan. I, 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 it was, I came to Michigan the year after. So it, this is um, six years out of graduate school. I'm back at, at Michigan a, as a faculty. And I remember it was probably in that first school year, you know, they would have these, it was National Center for Health Statistics have these um, uh, minority uh, health conferences. And then there's a final panel on, on the conference and, and 
speakers um one person representing the black population one person the hispanic one the native american one the asian american so i was the black person on the panel yeah. and we were charged to say based on this conference what 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 are the future as we look to the future what were the priorities for research and i remember saying that one of the priorities for research was for us to assess and empirically document the role of racism on health. And what had brought that to my mind is there had been a recent book published on the health of the African American community. And I had been asked to review it, be a reviewer for the book uh, for one of uh, a scientific journal. And is I this, had uh, Is this Ron Braithwaite? Right, right, Ron Braithwaite's book. Okay. And I, it was a great book. I liked it. And if I remember correctly, it was something like 31 of the 33 chapters explicitly stated that, and this is in my review, explicitly stated that racism or racial discrimination was a factor affecting African American health on the one hand. On the mm -hmm. other hand, I left that dissatisfied. Yeah. Because this, and I agreed with them, I believed it was a factor, but they were simply asserting it was a factor. They were not even making a conceptual case of the mechanisms and processes by which it worked. They were just talking about racism as a factor. And I said to myself, white folk can be laughing at us. We, mm -hmm. we need to do better than this. If, if we think racism is a factor, which I completely agreed with, we need to document and, and really think of how we can establish empirically that racism played a role. And I made that case at a conference. And I remember a gentleman raising his hand after I was through saying, I agree with Dr. Williams that racism is important and racism is a factor, but we could never do what Dr. Williams has said because racism cannot be measured. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to him, if you ask me today, do we have valid and reliable measures of racism that we can use in studies? I would say no. But I said, I see no reason why we couldn't develop them. And I remember saying to him, we measure self-esteem. Yeah. If we measure self-esteem, why can't we measure racism? We just haven't put our minds to it. Mm -hmm. And actually that comment, actually, it, it, I was already interested in it, but it was like the thing that pushed you over the cliff that you have yeah. got to do this. I, I have to develop um, measures uh, to capture racism. And I, I thought the easiest way to begin, given that I always had an interest in stress, working on the stress of unemployment as a graduate student, I thought, let me capture the stressful aspects of racism and how they might affect health. And I went to, and I read, there were two scholars work. I, I read particularly Joe Fagan, a sociologist, had um, a number of qualitative uh, papers on, on racism that described in the, in the words of African-Americans, describing the experiences of, of discrimination. And also Philomena Essed had a book called Everyday uh, Racism and Understanding Everyday Racism. And I read those books and I, I paid attention to the, the qualitative descriptions and try to say, how can I take these rich qualitative descriptions and develop measures that, that capture it? And out of that, um, I'm going to talk about James Jackson in a minute because he was pivotal to the work and the development. Out of that, I thought of three different measures. One, the everyday discrimination scale, the little indignities, because that, that was what's showing up in, in the qualitative descriptions. People were talking about little indignities that they experienced, but they were also talking about big, big things, being stopped, physically threatened, abused by the police, um, unfairly not hired for a job. So I had the major experiences of discrimination scale. And I also realized from reading the being embedded in this qualitative literature, people were also talking about the fact that because of the, the likelihood of encountering racism, they were taking steps to protect themselves. Um, they, they, and I developed also what I call the heightened vigilance scale. So mm -hmm. those were the three measures that came out of it. And I remember one day talking to James about the fact that I'm doing this and I'm developing it. And, and I think this is so important um, for us to do. And, and James was such a wonderful cheerleader. You know, I'm a little associate professor, just, just trying to find my way. And I, I just mentioned to James, he says, that's great. Let's do it. He says, I'll, I'll help you. I'll work with you. And um, I, you know, we, I, I was telling him that I was thinking, 
one way to do this is maybe I could propose to do the Detroit area study, which was a, 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 a survey research project out of the Department of Sociology that had existed since the, the 1950s, um, just in the post-World War II era, and it was done every year, and there was a, a three-course sequence that went with it, where students in sociology would get training with survey research, there'd be a different uh, PI uh, pro topic for each year that faculty could apply for, and I thought I could apply to be the, the faculty member to lead it. And James said, that is a great idea. And James said to me, I will do it with you. And he, and I don't really know if James actually even got credit from psychology for co-teaching this course. And it was a three course sequence with me. The first one was a pro seminar where the students just did was one credit, just a readings for, for the topic. And then the second one was one about the, the methods, the end of that. One, the students actually spent two weeks, uh, 10 days to two weeks in Detroit doing interviews and then re, re, uh, interviewers from the Survey Research Center would do the rest of the interviews, typically coming up with about 450 uh, a probability based sample uh, of, of interviews. And then in the fall, there would be a third uh, course, which was now the students would now have access to the data and would write papers based on the data. And James worked with me for those three semesters uh, out of his commitment to supporting this idea that I that I came. So I and he did something else that was really important. You know, you know, you know, James and, and James is a visionary. And James thought the Detroit area study sample is too small. He was going to raise money that we yeah. could do a much larger sample. And he raised money, honestly, not as much as he um, had expected or uh, would have liked, loved to have done. But we were able to increase the sample size from about 400 uh, to 450 to over 1,100. Um, as a result of the added funds that James went out of his way to raise for this project. And so I, I, I really think when I think of my work on discrimination, I cannot think of it without the seminal contributions that James Jackson made in, in supporting me with this idea that, that many people thought was crazy um, and, and really facilitating it by co-working with me and, and so on. Let me come to the question you asked, Woody, about how should we measure discrimination? And, you know, I could have asked the question, because of your race, have you been treated um, badly or been unfairly fired? Right. And we didn't do that. And part of that came from one of the things I wanted to avoid was um, creating characteristics in the interview context that would communicate to the um to the the respondent that we are looking for a particular answer and i thought if i had a whole series of questions because of your race has this happened because of your race has this happened because of your race that that would create that yeah. and james pointed me as well to the work of steve uh, trewile i don't know if you remember his work he yeah. had done some work around gender discrimination um that found that if you you, you, you could change the response patterns of individuals if you always said because of your gender, as opposed to giving them a clean description of what it was, having them report what they happened, and then finding out what they thought was the reason. And that's the structure we use. So right. I would say it was partly my inclination, but it was, uh, I think, supported by James um, heavily based on Steve Trimweiler's work, that that was the best way to go. So we do ask about the, try to get a, a clean description uh, of the event um, as, as neutral as possible, because we were afraid of over-report or under-report and wanted to get a good description. <clears throat> and then when someone reported the experience, we would then say, what do you think was the main experience for it? Yeah, that, that's a great story. And I, I actually know Steve Cheerweiler quite well. And he and I yeah. worked a lot together yeah. on the uh, outcome side of this, yeah. uh, the yeah. clinical diagnostic and yeah. sometimes known as mis- diagnosis. Yes. And I know you have a strong interest in that as well, but yes, we don't have time to get into that today. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're coming to a close here. Uh, I've got a few minutes left and there, you know, there are a couple things I want to, to talk about, to, to wrap up. 
But I wanted to give you a couple of minutes to clue us in on where you arrived at the phrase, the stimulus, unfair treatment, you know, as your mechanism to take people into thinking about discrimination. Uh, that, that's a good one. I mean, I, I think part of it um, emerged out of the qualitative uh, research. Mm -hmm. um, you know that, you know, if you if you listen to people descriptions, I mean, what what was the problem? It was that this treatment was unfair un unfair seemed to be um, a, a theme that 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 and, and I would say the the work Joe Fagan's work was on African Americans in the US. Philomena S's work was on African American women in California that she had done these in depth interviews with, as well as black immigrants from the Dutch Caribbean uh, to the Netherlands. And one of the striking things was, although we're looking at persons in the US and persons in the Netherlands, you saw similar stories. I mean, the, the, the stories are very similar of experiencing both big negative events um, at, as well as, as little day-to-day -day indignities. But the no, that was one source, was, was it seemed to be consistent with um, the, um, the early, um, you know, descriptions that, that people were given of the work. So that's one. The, the second um, uh, factor I would say is um, there was a literature out of psychology mm -hmm. um, describing the negative effects of, of, of discrimination on health. And I'm blocking on the name of this researcher. There was a researcher in Toronto um, who had done a lot of exper psychologists who had done experimental work um, and, and he had done some kind of more epidemiologic type surveys as well, but it mainly was an experimental work where he would actually manipulate unfair treatment. Like he'd bring people in and, and, and these students in and tell them, the, in, 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 the researcher would tell them that if they collaborated on this, then they would pay them $10 at the end. And then at the end, they would just not pay them the $10 that so they changed their mind, they're not gonna pay it. <laughs> And, and then he would measure the physiological reactions and psychological reactions to this experience of unfair treatment. So I, I yeah. think, and then he then developed work um, measures with, um, you know, immigrant populations, immigrant racial ethnic populations in Toronto, where he had scales capturing it. And he, he used the, the language of discrimination, but his measure was really um, unfair treatment. So I think both because there was a literature on the negative effects of unfair treatment. It seemed consistent with the themes that emerge in the qualitative literature. It seemed also to be not having baggage. And I think that's one of the things that James and I were very committed to, was not using language. We wanted to get a clean description uh, of the experience without having any potential baggage um, a, a language that might either lead to overreport or underreport, and 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 I think that's how we ended up with unfair treatment instead of using the terms racial discrimination or racial bias or, or bias and discrimination. We wanted as neutral language as possible describe the experience and have people tell us did that happen to them. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. You know, we were all trained to be you know survey methodologists. Yes, and, exactly. You know, and and you know the NS. BA, the National Survey of Black Americans, was about yeah. uh, precision measurement and how you did that in a face-to-face -face interview. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm really pushing the envelope here. We're almost out of time, but I, I have to ask mm -hmm. you a couple other questions. You know, as I remember, you know, and there, there were days when you and I were collaborating mm -hmm. on, Absolutely. you know, discrimination as an exposure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember running into, you know, there were the skeptics, by the way, I think, I think, relying heavily on methodological rigor is a good way to prepare for the skeptical response yes. that yes. you know is yes. coming. So, so much of what we do in research is wrapped in a political context. Yes. And, and, and we know it's going to be adversarial right. from day one. Um, but as I remember, we got a lot of uh, pushback on just using the word discrimination. Yes. That was controversial in yes. that day. Yes. Um, and so the, the, 
the solution, the compromise was to link the word discrimination with another word. Mm -hmm. And that word was perceived. Yes. So in the early days, I just remember being very upset and irritated that whenever it came to discrimination, I had to say it was perceived discrimination. But for all the other constructs that I was measuring, which were also based on self-report, I was not required to explicitly state they were perceived. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the kind of pushback you got? And if you remember, you know, being told at one point, you, you know, it was really perceived discrimination and not yes. discrimination. I, you're absolutely correct, Woody. Um, I would say in every single talk I gave in the early days of research on discrimination, if I had the, the title was discrimination and health, someone in the audience at some point would tell me that I should not be using the word discrimination I should be saying perceived discrimination because I didn't know whether discrimination had occurred or not. All I had was people's reports of it. So the correct thing to do was to say perceived discrimination after. And so I did that, you know, and I, you know, I did that when you submit to a journal, I, I did that. Um, one of the things that I think um, was, was also important was after a while, I would tell the audience because I know I'm always getting it that whenever I speak about this topic, Someone tells me to sit, use the word perceived discrimination, whereas when I used to do studies of unemployment and, and, and its effects on health and report on findings from the, the, that research, no one had ever said to me I needed to say perceived unemployment. They took at face value the measure, and I would literally educate the audience at the beginning of my talk that I'm <laughs> using the word perceived, and this is the why I'm using it, but I am also laying out the very diff the difference approach I get that in talking about unemployment or other stressful experiences, no one had ever said to me, I needed to use the word perceived. So it was one no, thing I would do to tongue in cheek to the audience right up front after a while. Well, I know my, you know, my version of this, you know, and I'm a social psychologist right. on the psychology side. And, and so my response was always, tell me something that's not perceived. Right. You right. know, like, I mean, we have eyeballs, that see the world and we have brains to process. So it just seems so ridiculous to me. And so obviously political and so obviously uh, discriminatory in the study of discrimination. So I guess from that aspect, it makes another sense. experience too, that, that showed just the sensitivity. I can think of two other experiences that shows the sensitivity to, to language around um, discrimination and especially racism. Um, at that time, I, I recall that, um, you know, there was a 2002 NIH uh, conference on we, the conference was on racial ethnic bias and health. But prior to the conference, maybe a year before James Jackson, Nancy Krieger from Harvard and myself were three outside researchers working with a small group co coordinated by OBSSR at NIH from different institutes that were trying to put this meeting together. And what they were thinking of was this, you know, research that was growing on the topic of racism, discrimination, and health. And we call ourselves the racism working group that they were going to, they wanted to get a request for proposals from NIH. And the process of doing that would be to convene a meeting of relevant experts to talk about what we know, what were the gaps, what were the research opportunities, and we would have these probably about monthly or, or bi-monthly meetings and you know talk about it. And when we came close to the time of the meeting, I said, well, what will we call the conference? And we all said, well, I mean, those of us external, um, racism and health. We would have said, no, we can't use the word racism. Can't do that. And remember, these were internal people on our side who wanted to see this agenda to move forward. And we said, we said, why not? They said, our, our directors will never, never support this if, if it's on racism. We said, okay, let's call it racial discrimination in health. They said, no, you no. can't use discrimination. <laughs> we said, why not? And they said, well, discrimination implies intent. So yeah. we can't use discrimination. And I remember we came up with racial ethnic bias in health. They said, yes, that's good. Bias. Bias does not imply intent. That's a good word. But it's just an example of where I was shocked to see NIH coming out with statements recently uh, since George Floyd's death on structural racism. You know, it's like, wow. Yeah. 
how have things changed you know yeah you know i mean if you hang around long enough and you're lucky <laughs> enough to live a few decades right you know and you keep your memory intact it's amazing yeah uh what you do notice uh but yeah. it also speaks to the slow pace of change with respect yes. to research and Absolutely. science so you, you have to hang in there uh, yeah. a long time and be persistent you know i spent a year at nih you know on the inside on the intramural side and i yeah. was shocked when i first showed up and people were actually mm -hmm. saying racism out loud yeah yeah you yeah. know and i had to check you know say like <laughs> did, did, did i really just hear you say that and so i think i think this this interview which you know we're concluding uh is going to be very useful in many ways but also very educational because i think a lot of our uh earlier career colleagues you know don't have that history yes you know they're showing up and people are talking about structural i mean i have books behind me there's probably you know seven or eight different types of racism that i yes. can read about and so i think it's going to be very informative to them to hear what it was like yeah. in the days when you could not even say Word. Uh, discrimination yes. all by oh. itself. So this has been a great interview. I, I actually got through most of the topics I wanted to ask you about. So so this was really good. Um, next time we get together, I, I'm going to zero in a little bit more on the the Heckler report. That was something that okay. was on my list. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Secretary's Task Force on Black yes, and Minority yes, yes. Health. We I, I we remember. definitely need to talk about that next time. Yeah. Uh, we get together. And I think uh, just that word bias deserves, mm -hmm. you know, 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, because since you did that conference, we now have, mm -hmm. you know, first it was unconscious bias, yes. now it's yes. implicit bias. Yes. Uh, but that word bias is a word I hear all the time. And I yes. think most of the time it's being used uh, mm -hmm. incorrectly and inappropriately. So I want to, I want to, conclude by just giving you a few minutes just to speak off the top of your head about any closing comments that you want to make. I would say to the listening audience um, that my career as a researcher really flourished when I came back to Michigan, um, working in sociology and the Survey Research Center, but with a formal affiliation with PRBA and being actively involved with a group of scholars at PRBA, including Woody <laughs> and James. Um, and I, I, I think that it, it's, that it's, it says something about the, the context and, and the support, just, just my description of my experience working with James. And as a still, I would say still very young scholar in the field, uh, it made a difference to have someone with his background and experience uh, working with me. Um, James did not do a lot of writing of first drafts of papers, but I can tell you every single paper I've ever written with James was much improved after he had edited uh, that first draft that I had written. And I think it's it's not wasn't just James and his leadership and his vision and his support, but it was also being part of a community where we work together. I can think of so many NIMH grants that we wrote in addition to for the center, uh, the, the center grants for the mental health center there at PRBA, as well as as grants for um, the NSAL study. Um, it, it, it was really, there's no question the best days of my career ha have been the days at Michigan um, as a faculty and PRBA is, is part of that story. And to me, it says something profound about the, the need for creating um, welcoming and affirming environments um, for uh, populations of color. Um, I was doing fine at Yale, but there's no question my career blossomed when I came back uh, to Michigan. And it was the whole context. Wasn't I was working with other people at SRC too, but I, I think PRBA was central um, uh, of the affirming environment. And I do think we need more James Jacksons in the world that that can replicate and create that kind of experience uh, for many of the younger scholars growing up today. Well, I really appreciate that. It was uh, just a, a wonderful, you know, concluding comment. And you know, I'll just add that um, I like to tease all of my friends and colleagues <laughs> about being a sociologist and a psychologist, and you're a physician. You know, that's just a lot of fun.
Uh, but uh, it's all done in jest. Absolutely. Because if there's one thing I learned by being part of PRBA, and I learned lots and lots of things, but the, the thing that always impressed me was how radically transdisciplinary yeah. we were. Yeah. You know, everybody sure. was there. Yeah. Political scientists, economists, I mean, yeah. just on up and down the line. Yeah. Nursing. I remember Barbara Nursing, was working with Barbara and projects. Yes. Yeah, psychiatry. Yeah. I remember yes. one, I can't remember her name, but there was a, a dermatologist that we had, you know, <laughs> it's just, it just never stopped. And um, I never forgot that. And so now, you know, in my work these days, I, I just always try to have as many different professions at the table. And, and that's not always easy to do. You know, I mean, it's always mm -hmm. much easier to just go with your own group. Yeah, because you don't, have the language issues, you know, you don't have the misunderstandings, uh, you don't have the subtle uh, insults that some people have, you know, when, when they say, oh, you, you do that, you know, as if to say, I didn't know people did that kind of work, but yeah, <laughs> this is what I do, you know, so uh, that was really what PRBA was all about, yes. that transdisciplinary focus, and in my opinion, that really leads Absolutely. to better science. Well, I want to thank you very much uh, for your time. We only went about six minutes over, so right. I think that was pretty good. I, I hope we can do this again because uh, there are many things to talk about. Sounds good. Great, great talking to you, Woody, and great working with you over the years. Yeah, uh, me too. I, I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Have Take a great care. day. See you later. All right. Bye-bye.